let's jump into some questions. And we've been collecting questions and researching what people might want to know from you, from us. Q, what's the first question we can dive into? Thanks, Ed. Our first question is, when you were first starting Blue Diesel at just 19, how did you convince early stakeholders to believe in your vision without a track record? <laughs> it was so bad. All right, so uh, <laughs> let me tell you a story uh, of, of how bad this was, okay? So when, when people hear these stories, like, oh, he grew a company at $700 million, you know, you must have been like a, a, a genius prodigy or something like that, or none of that, okay? So at the time, so I was, I was 19 years old. I wanted to start this business, not because I was business person. I was a theater major. I thought I was going to be an actor for a living, right? And I sucked at it. So thank God that that didn't work out. Very homeless actor. But it just so happened when I was 10 years old, I got access to a computer. I learned how to get online. And when the internet came around in the form that it is now, I was one of very few people that just happened to have known the technology. So I decided that maybe someone else would want this new thing that everybody was talking about called a web page, and I just happened to know how to do it. So to get my first client, okay, and this is to give you an idea of how green I was, to get my first client, my roommate in college, he was dating a girl whose father was doing consulting for the chief marketing officer for a company called AAA, you know, uh, uh, big in the States. And they were looking to do internet. Like back then they said, we need to do internet. They didn't even, they didn't even know how to, how, how to use the, the term back then. And, and nobody knew what it was, to be clear. So he's like, hey, they want to meet with you. And I was like, oh, that, that'd be wonderful, right? And I said, yeah, but they want to meet at your office. And I was like, oh, of course, you should absolutely meet at, at our, our office because of, of course we have an office, right? And I was like, you know, stop by any time. They're like, cool, we'll be there Friday. It's Monday, right? I'm like, hmm, <laughs> okay. So it's Friday or it's Monday. I have no staff. I have no company. I have no office. I have no office furniture, nothing, right? Here's how we pulled it off. I first, I walked down the street because I also didn't have a car. I walked down the street and I'm looking for vacant spots on campus that could serve as an office, but there are no offices on campus because it's a freaking campus, right? The only place I find is an old hippie clothing store that had been abandoned that was upstairs from a, a music hall, right? Like a concert hall right? Complete shithole, right? This place was disgusting, right? The bathrooms didn't even work, right? And I, I go to the landlord and I'm like, what, what, will you, what do you need for this for rent? Whatever. He's like, uh, $900. I was like, absolutely. He's like, it has to, it has to be here uh, you know, on, on the, the 30th of the month. I was like, absolutely. I had $16 in my bank account at that point, right? Like when I signed that lease. Okay. So needless to say, taking some chances, right? So now we have a giant space, this big old dilapidated hippie clothing store that has nothing inside it, just a big vacuous empty space. And it's Tuesday, Friday, we have to be fully up and running, okay? I go to, at Ohio State's campus, I go to Ohio State University's campus and they have a surplus division where all the stuff in the university goes to die. Right. Like I think of like back then fax machines and copiers and computers and stuff like that. And I go in there and there's just piles and piles of all this junk. And I go to the, the, the intern working there and I'm like, I need that pile of fax machines. I need the pile of monitors. I need the pile of keyboards, blah, blah, blah. He's like, none of that works. I was like, doesn't matter. Right. I need it all. Right. So we load all this stuff up in my buddy's pickup truck. We take it back to the office and we put everything everywhere. Right. Like old like desks and everything else like that. As Friday approaches, I tell all of my friends to bring the one clip on tie that they own and walk around like movie extras and pretend they're super busy. Now, the funny thing about that is if you ever watch an actual like movie or TV show in an office, you ever notice there's always people moving around. But if you're ever in an office, everyone's just like sitting at their desk, right? Like there's always like people on phones and having all these like, like walking conversations and none of that's real, but it looks cool. And so basically that, that was my, my theater background. I was like, okay, I need you to go from point A to point B, et cetera. And it exit stage, right? <laughs> and so when the client showed up, the place is teeming with people, right? Like everyone is like at their desk on their phones that don't work, like in front of their computers that, that have like gibberish on them, but nobody knew what that was back then. So it didn't matter. And I would take, I'd take the client through like the, this office space, right? And be like, you know, this is Ron, Ron handles whatever. I just make something up, right? And we finally make their way back to the one computer, my laptop, which was the only thing that worked in the entire place. And I'd show them a demo of a web page, and they were blown away. And as I'm doing that, I had like prompts where my friends would come up and be like, Will, what do you think about this? And it's like their book report or something. I'm like, run with it. And it, like, it was a whole thing, like, but it looked awesome. It looked awesome, right? Now here's the thing, charade, charade notwithstanding, we actually could do the work, right? I just wanna be clear. It, was, <laughs> it wasn't like I was, I was doing Elizabeth Holmes with them, right? Like, like our work was phenomenal, right? And they were gonna pay us peanuts to do the most amazing work we've ever done. So they were actually <laughs> getting one over on us. But, but what I knew, was so long as I could make it look like we were presentable for the work and so they give us a chance to do the work. I've got to point out, I was 19 years old at the time, okay? I still had pimples on my face and I, I looked like I was maybe in eighth grade, okay? This was long before Mark Zuckerberg's of the world and young people had any shot whatsoever 
at getting any kind of business whatsoever to prove that point. I'll fast forward two weeks later. Two weeks later, AAA wants me to go to their office, which I'm also unprepared for. I've never done a presentation in my life. I don't even know what a presentation is. And you couldn't Google it because the internet didn't exist yet, right? And, and I'm thinking to myself, like, what do people do in meetings? And all I had, my only reference for what meetings were, were like maybe what I saw on TV. And at the time, my favorite movie was a movie called Wall Street. So I just assumed like you had to show up like Gordon Gecko. So what do I do? I'm broke, mind you. I go to Goodwill and I look for any suit that will even remotely fit me. I find the most ill-fitting tweed three-piece suit. I look like a banker from like a, a 1950s commercial, right? I might as well have like a pocket watch and a monocle, right? It's so ridiculous. And put it on a, a kid who looks like he's 12 years old, right? It, it couldn't have been more ridiculous. So with that, I borrow my roommate's car because I don't have one. And I drive out to the meeting. I go in the meeting and I, I set things up and I'm presenting. And I'm thundering away for 45 minutes straight. And for those of you that have given business presentations, you never want to thunder away for 45 minutes straight. What that means is no one's listening. <laughs> and so, so after my presentation where I'm explaining the origins of the internet and blah, 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 all the people in the room, and there's like 12 people in the room, and it looked like the Jedi Council. There's nobody there under 100 years old, right? Kind as can be, but not, not the youngest folks. They just look at me like jaws wide open. And the CMO looks around the room, as if he's like scanning to get everybody's buy-in. And he looks at me and he goes, son, by the way, in a business presentation, you never want to be addressed as son. There's nothing cool about that. They, nothing comes after a son that also says, you're the smartest person I met. He said, son, do you know we have letterhead older than you? And I was like, that's literally your only question. <laughs> it's their only question. They had no idea what I just said. All they knew is they needed internet. And this kid in this $8 suit was, was, was internet. So when we talk about like, what does it take to sell? Part of it means just showing up, right? Part of it's like most people won't do the things that you need to do in order to get those opportunities. So part of it is just stepping up. For me, I had nothing to lose. I'm like, I'm out $8 on the suit. But other than that, you know, I'm good. And I owe $900 at the end of the month. So I'm hoping you'll pay me soon. But but that was it. And what happened? Did you win the job or? We did. We did. First client. That was our first client. And I've never been ridden so hard by a client in my life. For the, for the amount of money that they paid us, I'm not even kidding. I'll give you like real dollars. I think I worked like seven years for them for $1,500. Wow. <laughs> yeah, like it was, I'm, I'm only half kidding, but I remember later on that the guy who had in, made the introduction to us, who was my, my roommate's girlfriend's father, he said to me, he's like, yeah, I knew all along we were totally underpaying you. I was just waiting for you to do something about it. <laughs> it's like, thanks, thanks. Watch. So translate that to our founders today. Like they're mm -hmm. listening to this story and they're thinking, okay, that's times past. Will has definitely qualified himself as a dinosaur. We all are here. <laughs> the given, yeah. What would you say is the equivalent of that today for a founder today in our community? Well, you know, I mean, some of it, there isn't an equivalent, right? Well, thank God, right? In other words, like you don't have to go up into a group of strangers and do an awkward business presentation in an $8 suit anymore, right? Like you can post a profile on Upwork and people will send you business, right? Like, <laughs> it's way easier. Now, now that said, it's also harder because there's a million people that can do it. It's harder to differentiate, right? Like when I walked into that room to give that presentation, there was no one coming in after me. It was just me. I cold called every company I had ever heard of, like Intel, MasterCard, Chase Bank, et cetera. And I, and I basically would just call the main line. I mean, as dumb as this sounds and said, can I speak to the internet person? And sure enough, there was one person that had been called the internet person and mm -hmm. I would get routed to them and I got them as clients, right? Like I was just willing to do stuff that most people wouldn't be willing to do. And I think that is how you differentiate yourself. If I just go on Upwork, and that's why I use the example, and I post one of a million profiles, how did I do anything different, right? I think now you got to be creative. I see people doing it on social and how they stand out, right? I see it in some of the work that they do. I see it in the content they produce. That you got to make yourself extra special. I didn't have to be special at all because there's no one else. Now there's so many. But I remember you telling me lots of stories. You have a background in sales. And I think this yeah. goes to founder-led sales. So many founders, they just want to build it. And they think it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. Like they yeah. got, they're just like in their mind, it's the most amazing thing ever. And they refuse to pick up that phone. And I hearken back, I tell founders this all the time, like the wealthiest people, I saw a stat, like 80% of them were in direct sales right from the beginning. Like yeah. even if you look at Warren Buffett, he sold candy and Mark Cuban went door to door, right? right. And a lot of people see Mark Cuban as he is now, this Dallas Mavericks, he's since sold and he's this guy on Shark Tank, but he started in the internet. Like he yep. had broadcast.com and yep. he was doing all these things and he cut his teeth on direct sales. And that's what you've demonstrated is yep. go out, pick up the phone and call people. Yeah, I mean, and my thing is you just have to get good at being told no. 
right? Getting cold yes is the easy part. Getting cold no is the hard part, right? And I guess the only reason it worked for me was because I didn't expect anybody to say yes. Like when somebody said, yes, we'll give you business, I'd be like, really? <laughs> I like, ah. like I expected the answer to be no. And so when I heard anything other, I was like, wow, bonus. Yeah, that's always great to hear. And that's so empowering. You know, when a founder goes out there and they start selling and they get that first order, man, that feels good. Oh, it's the best feeling in the world. You feel that's like you, awesome. you, you just uh, conquered the world.